Hey guys, got a little break in the bumper to bumper. I am spending a Monday afternoon braving the traffic. Look at that over there. Coming out of LA and going into Orange County to pick up a guitar, one of the few that I've bought off of eBay. There are a number of reasons why I don't typically buy one off of eBay, but we are going down into Orange County and then I'll make the trip back up to Acton where I live. So I'm going to have about five hours in this drive before it's over. So this guitar better be something else. I'll see you when I get there. We're getting close now. Pacific Coast Highway in the land of opulence and wealth and other words I don't know what they mean. Anyway, you look that up. I need to drive and pay attention. All right, here we are, the guitar shop on North Coast Highway. Let's go in here and see what they got. There's money around here, so there's likely to be good guitars around. Ooh. Yeah, this is definitely Coveter's Paradise. Check this out. Oh, right on, man. Thanks. Perfect. Three months. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be quicker than that. It's going to probably start getting work on. All right, let's go see what we came for. We'll have to delay that for just a second. Remember the Texas junk pile? Well, there's a real Gibson 175. Look at that. Cool. A lot of cool guitars around here. Ooh, there, there's what the Brownsville guitar that you see me showing around every once in a while is supposed to be made after, but... Wow. Check that out. A lore 175 knockoff. Anyway, let's quit dreaming here and go see what we're after. Hey, talk about the next coolest t-shirt to mine. Guitar shop. Laguna Beach. Nice t-shirt. We're going to have to grab one of them up. But All right. We're going to call this one the... Laguna Beach lawsuit because this is definitely a 60s model lawsuit guitar. Check this out. Knock off of a Gibson and somebody put a tag on it says DECA, like DECA Records. So somebody was capitalizing on everything. I picked up this guitar. It's amazingly light. It's beat up a tad, but it's in good shape for what I'm going to do with it. Anyway, we'll get back to the bench and have a closer look, but yeah, the Laguna Beach lawsuit. All right, a lot of cool stuff, but coolest thing yet, Chick Flick Teal guitar strap. That last one I had went off to Belgium with Gallia Volt, so there we go, must have. Now let's get to All right, guys, we are in the shed with... Um, my new find, the DECA arch top that I named affectionately the Laguna Beach Lawsuit Guitar. Um, you know I take law classes in my spare time. Uh, I don't want to be litigious unless I can uh, be, but um, we're going to talk today about lawsuit guitars. And it's one of those topics that, well, to be frank, I'd have to change my name. Now, the purpose of this is we're going to go through and talk a little bit about lawsuit guitars. I'm going to give you the basic information uh, you need, and then we're going to do um, a little, where is it, uh, before on this guitar, because it'll turn into something later, and then we'll talk about that after. So this is the before part. So let me set this aside here without having it fall to the ground because it's done that before and I'm going to show you in this episode how I know that. 
Um, we're going to see some JB weld. I never heard of that being used before, but it doesn't surprise me. But you're going to see some of our old friends like the Northridge Nightmare, this 1964 Crucianelli model 1200 panoramic and then you're going to see one that you haven't seen before this ventura this japanese ventura guitar 60s early 70s and that might fit into the classification that we're talking about lawsuit guitars now this is one of them things where you might want to turn this off right away give me a like before you do let's get the housekeeping out of the way but this is one of those episodes that you might just want to turn it off if you've bought a bunch of guitars already because you ain't going to want to know. Uh, but if you haven't and you're talking about going on a spree, then you should probably look at it because if you buy too many guitars, you're going to end up needing the matchbook of the episode, the crying towel. That's right, the crying towel. I picked this up on a trip down into the Joshua a tree area of California with Kendra a few years ago. We built a guitar and uh, I'll show that to you sometime. But uh, hey, you don't want to cry and tell. Now, while we're getting stuff out of the way, match or uh, barrel house word of the episode, spree. Did you think that was a new word? No, it's an old word. And uh, it means a period of uncontrollable, a period of uncontrollable behavior usually with adverse consequences, now primarily used with regard to shopping. So can you think of anything where you go on a period of uncontrolled behavior, usually with adverse consequences, like your bank account, now used primarily with regard to shopping? Hmm. I really don't see anything that could make me think that I fit into that category. Can you? can't hear you. Yeah, no, you're right. Anyway, check this out. I want you to check this out. See that shape? We're going to be talking about that open book shape here in a minute. Anyway, give me a like. Subscribe if you haven't. Let me get these glasses off. And uh, let's talk about lawsuit guitars. Okay, let's start off with some basic law. First, disclaimer. Am I an attorney? No. You know how you can tell? Well, number one, I'm likable. Number two, I tell you the truth. Uh, number three, I'm, um, I'm human, right? Yeah, that pretty much covers it. So I'm not an attorney, obviously. Okay, next. There's a concept in this country, and I think it's gone elsewhere, that if, let's say, my name is something and I make something that's distinctive, maybe even brand new, or it has a certain shape or a certain style, that I have a right to be able to profit from my endeavors of research and development or creativity or what for X period of time or whatever. And that's where you get copyright and trademark laws and that kind of thing. So let's say, for example, my name is Gibson and I make a headstock that looks like the open book thing there. And uh, I write Gibson on it. And let's say I'm this other dude and I come along and I just trace this and make this Gibson and, and put a V instead of a B. Uh, if I'm Gibson, I might have a problem with that, especially if I'm representing that the quality of this thing is equal to or better than the person that invented it. So kind of store that one in mind. Next, let's say that I develop a distinct body shape on an instrument that has F holes uh, and um, same thing. I may not like someone coming along and tracing this and um, representing it as something that they invented or making money off of uh, the idea I have, especially if it's really distinct. Now, you recognize this shape as a Gibson L4 or L5 uh, body style, um, and I think anybody that knows guitar history says that the F holes come around and were invented by Gibson. Actually, Lore put them on. He was an employee of Gibson about 1921, if I'm right. Before that, they had a sound hole right here, but yeah, this is all stuff that Gibson did, and um, you may recognize 
kind of copies of other Gibson body styles like the 300 series maybe I don't know like maybe this Florentine cutaway that you might see on a Gibson ES175 um, so I'm not saying that if you invent something with a motor and four wheels that's steerable and can go down the public highway that you can't call it a car uh, but if you take something that looks like a Mustang exactly and you call it a Mustav you might have Ford Motor Company chasing you so let's get a couple specifics about these lawsuits and when they happen and what kind of guitars you'll see now personally I think from the time these guitars started coming out somebody was tracing them and trying to build them at home I, I don't think that that's uh, out of the ordinary but what I do think is out of the ordinary is when people start to make them and they look exactly the same and they start to produce them in a way that the consumers are buying them up and the impact of those purchases is impacting the person that invented it or has the copyright or trademark on it I think that's what happens so when we start looking at these guitars which are oh, by the way all of these uh, are not Gibsons these this is a Gibson for sure um, but the ones that were here that we're seeing here were all made in the 60s not uh, the 70s possibly this Ventura but I think the headstock shape tells us a story that says it might not have been in the 70s um, because here's why in the late 70s and along the way up to that there, there were people making all kinds of guitars that looked exactly like Gibson guitars there's a company called Ibanez which is still around that was making just dead knockoffs of Gibson's and the Gibson company realized some of these guitars that Ibanez is kicking out is are equal to or possibly even better than the guitars we're making and so there was another guy that was making a few guitars in in a shed somewhere kind of like I do and he started getting into the Japanese interest in importing things and so you saw a lawsuit develop called Gibson versus Ibanez and that's what this was about people uh, making large quantities of almost direct knockoffs of Gibson guitars there was another action against a company called Hoshino which was a lot of your Japanese brands back then of course they had a guy in America that was representing them so uh, what Gibson was after was going out and getting a hold of as many of these instruments as they could and destroying them and taking legal action and shutting down the factories that were making these direct knockoffs and to some extent they were highly successful because I think you will find in the history books that some of these factories as part of the settlement were taken over by Gibson so Gibson is going in and getting a trained group of people that know how to knock off their instruments so I think Gibson come out of it okay it certainly I think prompted Gibson to take a look at their quality control and get their instruments back to maybe what people had thought they should be before they turn to other sources to buy anybody can buy a cheaper instrument for a knockoff but when you start getting to the point where you're making a decision between the original company and a knockoff and the quality is an issue that's probably a problem so hey I got a couple of ideas first let me make cigar box guitars and license plate guitars and coffee can guitars and whatever kind of guitars except toilet seat guitars and bedpan guitars that, that's just a really crappy idea I hate that just so you know anyway so I'm gonna make these things I'm gonna make my own necks which I do in fact here's a handful right here right you know this I haven't quit doing this guys I'm just into these arch tops I made a couple hundred videos about the other kinds of guitars other people are doing that and my hit count isn't what it used to be but hey you know I'm not in, in this to make money but some people are in this to make money so let's say that I cut those headstocks out to look like this open book pattern. Do you think that Gibson, having virtually shut down everybody in the world that was doing their guitar knockoffs in the 1970s, might not just send me a letter from Gibson corporate saying, hey, 
you know what, do not use that as a headstock pattern. That's ours. And uh, we took Ivan as down over. We might shut down your little cigar box manufacturing plant, i.e. the shed. So don't do that. Next, don't just get this guitar that you find at a yard sale or trolling around in the North San Fernando Valley before 6 a.m. one morning and just decide, I'm going to get it cheap, I'm going to do a few simple repairs, and I'm going to call this thing a lawsuit guitar. That way, when people are searching for lawsuit guitar, they find it and I can claim an extra 150 bucks worth of value just because I say it's a lawsuit to guitar. If you've bought one of those and you're finding this out, anyway, you might not a, you might not want to watch this next part. Unless of course you got the crying towel. So here's the deal. Let's say you run across an Ibanez guitar that has a headstock that looks like this. And through model numbers someone tells you you can tell from this model number that this is a lawsuit your guitar wrong two things most of the Japanese guitars did not have model numbers or serial numbers inside the guitar that was kind of the way around it when you start taking things and making them look exactly and then labeling them and that's called fraud so they were kind of sticking away from that so if somebody tells you that an Ibanez guitar that does not have that headstock shape, that it's a lawsuit guitar, probably not. If you look inside, you see model numbers and serial numbers, probably not. So I wouldn't be out buying up guitars at my level, trying to find lawsuit guitars or put a label on them just so I can, you know, buy something for a hundred bucks and then sell it for two fifty. And then walk around wondering if I'm going to see that person again or I'm going to get bad feedback on my eBay site, right? Think that out. If you're into this for lawsuit guitars, you're probably a collector. You know better. And at least do a little bit of background. Start with Wiki or something else. I'm not the authority on this, but I do know enough to know if something was made by Crucianelli in the 1960s or if it was a Japanese brand or um, if it was indeed made by Gibson. Now, let's quit talking about this and move on to this guitar here, this DECA arch top. Okay, let's talk about this guitar in particular. Is this a lawsuit guitar? Legally, no. Here's why. This is a DECA. It was made in the 1960s. It was made in Japan. The, the sticker inside says Something about New York City, but it identifies it as a DECA guitar. Um, it's got a uh, Gibson L body style. Who else was doing this? I don't know. K, uh, Harmony, anybody that could trace out a guitar body, maybe. Um, but this guitar was from the 60s. The lawsuits were in the 70s. So dating this thing uh, tells us no it's not a lawsuit guitar so what else about it well look at that name does that name look familiar to you oh i don't know maybe deca record company any connection so let me get this right i am an importer i pretend that these guitars are coming out in new york city um some people might hear New York City and automatically assume there's some validity to that. While others may think LA or Hollywood or something is somehow significant. But um, unless it's made in Beverly Hills, then I, um, I'm not sure any of that's significant. But to the consumer, you think, hey, I'm listening to all kinds of 45s right now. I'm listening to DECA was a big label, so all of a sudden I see this, and I think this is related to this, and it's cool, and it looks like a Gibson, and bingo, I'm selling these. So, is this guitar worth a lot of money? Well, um, not so much. And now we're going to go through it on the bench. We're going to take a look at this specific guitar. Um, 
what I saw about it on the internet before I went and got it, and then what I saw when I got there and, and kind of what I'm going to do. Uh, and so this is, again, the before, and you're going to see this show up somewhere. It'll always be called the Laguna Beach Lawsuit Guitar, so I'll look for it after. Now let's go to the bench and take a closer look. All right, let's do a flyby on this guitar. Um, it looks pretty clean, um, top to bottom. And um, this is actually an eBay guitar, and I usually don't buy off of eBay because once you get $70, $80 into shipping and all that, and you get it there, um, yeah, it's pretty easy to have a bad experience. Now, I'm starting to have some questionable things showing up on um, Facebook Marketplace, and that's not Facebook's problem. Uh, but yeah, by far, my best source has been offer up for these old arch tops. Anyway, one more time. There it is. It started off in San Diego. The bid price along with the shipping price and the guy that was selling this was going to make it pretty easy and reasonable to ship in fact one of the lowest prices i've ever seen he had confidence in the ad that said hey i can get this to you without being broke out but it was going to be pretty easy to get up into close to 300 dollars for this guitar now i want you to see here that along the edges there are a few chips here and there so this guitar has been around the block there is no binding that's hand painted you can see from the little smudges there at the end the fret markers um, are kind of stuck on you can see one's missing at the third fret but the rest of them are there it has the pit guard the original pit guard um, and no one has screwed things down so tight that that's cracked it's got the original bracket um, it appears to have the original um, floating bridge and it's got a very distinctive tailpiece so uh, another thing to tell DECA guitars about apart from others the F holes are a little bit unique they don't tie into each other um, like you would see on the Crucianale let's see how the camera angle looks you can see that F holes um, are one there and these are separate I've seen this on a couple other guitars um, that have that but overall this is a classical shape now let's turn it over all right there we go it all appears to be in pretty good shape looks to be uh, the original tuners um, there's a scuff marker too up at the top of the headstock but these are all okay they're open geared doesn't appear to have any work done the holes uh, don't have new screws nothing's loose um, sometimes on the tuner gear itself you'll see different color things so not, none of this has ever had any work done uh, again there's some chips and stuff here and there but all in all it's a pretty good um, it's in pretty good shape really so trust me on this um, put our thing here it's a 25 and a half scale um, it lines up with the way I build my necks out. Um, I don't see, you saw that episode, Buyer's Guide to Cheap Arch Tops. I'll give you a link right up there right about now. I did a couple episodes to kind of help you. I've got some good feedback from somebody. In fact, I got some feedback from someone who has a um, Archcraft guitar exactly like the one that I did in the episode or the playlist. I'll just give you the playlist about the Archcraft junk pile guitar. I'll give you that up there right about now. But now that we take a closer look, is there any shadowing here that says that the bridge has been uh, taken off or adjusted? No, there's not. Um, I don't see any cracks anywhere here. There's nothing that tells me that there's ever been any work done on the fretboard. So there's not different color. Uh, frets here there's not one up over the other there's no spots where people have been drilling into it and trying to replace or or do a, a hippie neck reset or anything like that but there are a couple of things that make me worry and let's have a look at those we're going to start off by pulling up a good, trashed out guitar here and looking at the inside to set up this next part so bear with me okay this is an old harmony a six string flat top it's got a truss rod in it um, but I have 
left the top of it. I've actually bought it this way, so it was in somebody's shed because it's pretty cool. You can tell from looking back here how thick these tail pieces and head pieces are right here that you're trying to screw through or attach things to. But I want you to notice that once you start taking these, these parts in and of themselves are very thin and flimsy. So the sides, the bottom, the top, all of that, they're highly dependent on each other structurally. Now I want you to pay attention here is these braces. There's a series of braces here. Now on uh, a flat top guitar with a flat back as well, this is pretty easy. You take a flat piece of wood, you bevel it down, you make sure it sits there and since it's flat, it's pretty easy to glue in. Now an arch top, that's a little bit different because you used to have to um, basically cut the arches in on the braces to reflect what the arch was. So here it would be a little bit higher in this area, a little bit lower there because the arch top tapers off towards the uh, edge and comes back up here like so. We know that. So a flat top guitar, one thing. Arch top with age and temperature changes and people not paying attention to what's going on in the garage or the attic. This hide glue gets hot, works loose, and next thing you know, you've got one of these loose. Now, if you can take the top of the guitar off to fix it, that's one thing. But always remember, when you start taking these things apart, look how flimsy this is. This isn't good, and you always risk taking one of these apart and never being able to put it back together. So consider what's going on when you do that. I like to have this around because it shows you all kinds of binding details and all that kind of thing. But if you go to buy a guitar and you have these loose inside or the kerfing is coming loose, this kerfing is what allows you to glue things on all the way around uniformly. We saw some kerfing replacement on the Archcraft junk pile. I'll give you the kerfing episode right up there right about now so you can kind of see what that's all about. But if these are loose in a guitar, you want to know this, especially if it's an F-hole guitar because your access is zilch on, a, on an F-hole guitar. So let's get the um, deck of guitar back up here. The Laguna Beach lawsuit guitar and have a look. There might be a problem. Okay, notice I always have the bean bag there and my uh, cork neck rest uh, right there. I, I swear I'm going to cut loose on one of those um, guitar service centers that um, Stu Mac has out. I just don't want to get off the money just yet. But anyway, so here we are. Back to the brace. Now, if there's a brace loose, I can rattle the guitar and hear it. It might be a marble, it might be something in there, but once you're relatively sure that you've got um, nothing in there and you're still hearing a noise, like check this noise out. Hear that? You hear that? That tells me there's a brace loose, right? Just turn it over. You go around and tap on the guitar. You know, guys that used to build these arch tops and the guys that do it by hand, they go around and tone the guitar like this. They don't depend on what it sounds like or they just assume that it's going to be okay. They go around and they carve the wood off by doing that kind of thing. But when we come in here and I... And I lift this up a little bit. Right there, I'm hearing that's either a crack or it's a loose brace, right? Well, if it's a loose brace, what am I going to do? I can look down in here and I can try to get some tools together and use like the end of the chick flick teal point or some earthquake wax on it or something. But I got to kind of be able to go to the back side of the guitar and figure out from the way this is what the shape of that brace would be or I have to figure out how to get something in there, clamp it, hold it down and put a bunch of glue in there and use hide glue and not have it leak out. But I can see the brace down in here and there's one there and there's one up there and there's a couple that run 
right up in here. I can feel them and they're pretty thick. So the ones up here are okay. And I took a camera and looked inside here. I couldn't see a loose brace. So if I'm hearing this, there it is. What can that be? Ready for a surprise? Okay, first off, let's take a closer look. Look at this, look at this bridge. Let's get it right, can you see it? Does that look straight to you? No, it's tilted back, isn't it? And the grooves on this thing are really, really deep. Really deep in comparison. Most of the time you just want your strings running just cresting that bridge is barely, but these are down in here a quarter of an inch in some cases. That's not right. But again, I don't see any shadows that say that this thing has ever been moved. Now, I haven't taken the strings off of this yet, but the string action, that's a 12th fret, isn't really that bad right there. Um, it, you're certainly not going to be playing a uh, fine jazz guitar on it, but it's not that bad. The nut's okay. Doesn't look like it's been replaced. Of course, they didn't use the highest quality materials, but what is going on here? Oh, do you see what I see? Look right there. You see that crack? It goes all the way around right there. And it goes to the other side. And it's in the same place. Hmm. See, it goes all the way up there. What could that mean? Okay, I've told you a million times. The worst thing that you can do is buy one of these that needs a neck reset. And if it does, you just got to figure out, I'm going to put a screw in it, uh, do a Troy Murrah neck reset, put a bolt in it or whatever. In fact, I gave you an episode, I think this is the last card I have left, about how to bolt a neck on a cheap guitar. Um, and I did some camera work and showed you how to do that with nylon stop washers. But theoretically, I've told you when the neck gets weak and starts to cut loose right here and gaps this way, that's going to bring the neck up, which brings your action up really high. Now, let's say I want to be really tricky. I could basically take a saw and I could cut here up to here with one of these thin pull cut flat saws like this we all have these I could basically cut the neck off right here up to here and I could very carefully saw this where this whole neck came off right strings are off I heat this part up break the hide glue loose cut this loose I could literally pick this whole thing right off of here I could do some sanding and whatever here and I take off enough to compensate for where my neck is high right here and bring that down. I could even do that in a way that would bevel this. I could adjust this angle. Is that what happened here? No, I don't think so because it would be very difficult to try to hide that and I don't feel where anybody's put a bolt in or anything. It would be very difficult to hide that and end up with the original paint. And finish so I don't see how that could have been done there's no evidence of it that's one way to do it but watch out for that if you start seeing this part of the heel up a little bit more and evidence that there's hide glue under here we're gonna see one called fingerboard diving board I think I've done that episode already it kind of shows you where something's happened so you see if it's been cut off here here remember when you cut it off here you get a gap the width of this saw blade and if that's done here and glued back on and it's not done up here of course that's going to pull the angle back down but watch out for this kind of stuff you start getting into these guitars for 250 and 300 dollars and that's been done you are definitely going to need the crying towel and if you can sing that good enough maybe deca will give you a contract anyway i don't see that that's been done i do see that this has been compensated for by sanding off the bottom of the bridge and cutting the grooves in the bridge deeper. I do see that. So, 
what about this line? How did this happen? Okay. So, we know that the grain on this guitar, get my pointer, the grain on this neck runs this way. You can see it. If you were to make a neck that the grain ran this way, it'd be very, very expensive. So the grain runs this way. Well, when it gets to here, what do you think the grain does? Well, on a tree branch, the grain would continue to run this way. It wouldn't be the same extension. This would have been another piece of wood that's been cut down or added on. But the grain wraps around. So, this split that we're seeing right here, I had the camera away, sorry, but again, the grain running this way doesn't switch ways here. It goes around here like a branch is is uh, supported by addition of wood here, but it runs with the grain. So the grain is running here. This crack is with the grain. So how does that happen? Well, let's say that I have the guitar standing up and I let it fall over and this part right here impacts something very heavy. Well, this part of the body down here is thicker and weighs more so, all of the stress hits where? Right there. So, let's say I have this on the floor. And because the top of the headstock has a scarf joint, it's angled down. You can see that, right? Let's say I step on the guitar right here. Or something gets thrown onto the guitar right here. See, because I'm not seeing... The neck impacts right there that would cause this. If some gets thrown on it, some gets stacked on it, the case doesn't get shut right, bingo, the crack is right there. Okay? So, what do I do about this? Well, if I wanted to reinforce it, you want to remember that. Some of these have a dovetail system, some of them have a V, and if you were to put a screw right in here, at this point, you'll catch the bottom of the V or the dovetail. You might split it out and actually ruin the guitar. But if I was going to go up here and try to bolt it through this way, through that head plate that's up there, that's not going to do much for me. But if I wanted to reinforce it, what I could do is drill a hole down through here, making sure I get past here, and then run a piece of doweling through there and tap it in there with a bunch of glue on and make sure that this is supported between here and here. I certainly wouldn't want to go drilling around in here now with this being cracked the way it is. That might be the last straw, just like my pointer, my chick flick teal pointer jumped out of my hands right there at the thought of that. All right, we got way out in the weeds there, but back to this. I can't see where one of the braces is loose. What could this be? Well, it's related to everything we just looked at. Something happened with the neck. The action's starting to come up. People are working the bridge instead of doing a, doing a neck job. And when you lower the bridge, what happens to the tailpiece? A well, bridge goes down, tailpiece goes down. The bridge is supposed to touch the guitar. We're going to do an episode about how... Uh, these guitars resonate with their bridges built the way they are and how F-holes are the worst thing that's ever happened to an acoustic guitar even though they look cool and made people think they're rich because they look like a violin. But, what happened here? Well, there's supposed to be a space between the body of the guitar and the bottom of the tailpiece, the trapeze here, and there isn't. What does all that mean? All right, you, you know I recycle coat hangers because we have F-holes. We can take a magnet on a coat hanger, grab up anything we want. Six, ten string crack hack was a perfect example of fishing wires up through the F-hole. But let me show you something here. We're going to take a coat hanger, a piece of coat hanger. We are going to cut it so it's about that long. We are going to bend it in half, like that. We're going to make sure that both ends end at the same place, 
like that. There we go. Now, note that it looks like this. We are going to bend this end out like this. And we're going to bend this end out like this. Do you see that? Bend them just a little bit past 90, like so. Now we're going to take a piece of our tape here that we use for binding. We're going to put a piece there, like so. We're going to put a piece there, like so. We want this padded, and here's why. We're going to make sure that the trapeze tailpiece is not the cause of our noise. We don't want to scratch up the top of the guitar anymore to find that out. So there we go. You don't need to spend $25 for that. Now, one more time, we're going to pick this up over here. Turn the camera just a bit. Hear that rattling? I'm going to take this scraparatus. I'm going to squeeze it together. I'm going to stick it in here. And now I'm going to pick the, up the guitar. The weight of the guitar will cause the bridge or this trapeze tailpiece to move away from the body. And look at that. Our noise is gone. It was never a brace inside. It was action coming up, neck relaxing, maybe from that break before somebody glued it. What did they use to glue it? Well, if that right there is not JB Weld, I don't know what is. Uh, next clue for you is along this joint. If you see dust in there, you're playing the grandma spit game. You don't want to do that during COVID. I wouldn't like it if somebody spit in a rag and then wiped it on my guitar and gave it back to me. But if there's dust here, that never seems to go away once you wet it down and try and wipe it off. Yeah, it's embedded in the glue that was used there. So that somebody JB welded this thing back on. It has been off the guitar. It has a, it had its effects. So I'm going to have to replace the bridge on this. I'm going to get this up a little bit. That could be something as simple as putting a little shim under there and getting that up a tad. But mainly what I have to do here is get this thing off of the body. Now, what am I going to do with this thing? You're going to see some junk piling up. You're going to see the neck. Look at the neck change. I'm going to leave the headstock the way it is, but this thing is going to scream when I'm done with it. Watch for it in a future episode called Whatever Happened to the Laguna Lawsuit. All right, guys, there we go. Appreciate your patience. Sometimes I get way out in the weeds. We've talked about lawsuit guitars. We've talked about the importance of not using that on the headstocks you make. Make your own thing. Make it a little bit different than something else. Uh, make it flat. Make it roundy. Put a little curly cue in it. Do whatever you do. But you don't need to have Gibson chasing you down. And they got lawyers out there. That's all they've got to do is make sure that you don't copy their stuff. Um, to be really frank with you, Having $300 into this guitar the way it looks is scary. I wouldn't do that, and the price I pay reflects that. I'm starting to get a reputation around here where they know, hey, that guy, um, especially when you're buying on Facebook uh, Marketplace, they link back to who you are and see what you're doing right away. And um, I've had good luck with that. Guys will give me a decent price. I don't ever expect someone to take a beating. If they paid $150, I don't come in and say $125 and then, you know, um, give them uh, where they're looking at losing money on the deal. I, I, I don't insult people that way. This guitar was actually down in San Diego. Um, rather than have the guy go through boxing it up and whatever, he met halfway up uh, from me where I was and that ended up being in Laguna Beach. But this guitar was in San Diego. I'm happy with it. It's going to fit my purpose. But again, there goes Super Bowl of Motocross. Hey, guess what? It's easy to win if you're the only racer at your house, right? 
Hey, while we're on that subject, you ever see people buying trophies at yard sales? No, not me. Yeah, I'm the only one that ever did, right? Hey, but to that point, why are you buying second and third place trophies? Why don't you just buy the first place trophy? If you're going to lie, be good at it. With that, let's get out of here. I'll see you next time and watch for the Laguna Beach lawsuit junk pile in a future episode. See ya.